Om igyan timidandasya kena jena salakaya chaksu un militam mirinatas my shri guru vena maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapti Tamya in the Bhutale Swayam Lupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Dadati Kam. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaur Vani Put. Say Sansun Yuva Pastyatya De Satarine. Panchakalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pevacha Tita Anam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnava Vyo Namaha Om Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gitalakar Sri Vasadi Gaur Vakta Rinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so this uh, section of the Bhagavatam is uh, part of the teachings of Lord Kapila Dev, who is none other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And this section is dealing with bhakti, especially the position and understanding of jiva, the soul. Mm -hmm. I will begin. Tada purusho atmanam kevalam prakrite param nirantaram swayam jyotir ani manam makanditam. Translation At that time, the soul can see himself to be transcendental to material existence and always self effulgent, never fragmented, although very minute in size. Report by Srila Prabhupada. In the state of pure consciousness or Krishna consciousness, one can see himself as a minute particle, non different from the Supreme Lord. Hmm. So, pure consciousness is Krishna consciousness or natural consciousness, pristine consciousness, uh, consciousness that's not touched by, not tainted by anything material. And in that consciousness, it says here, one can see himself non-different from the Supreme Lord. Uh, that does not mean that one is the Supreme Lord. It means that there is a qualitative oneness between the soul and the Supreme Lord soul. Nitya, uh, nityanam, chaitanas chaitananam, eko bahuda viridati kamam. So there is one eternal, Nityo, maintaining all the other eternals, Nityanam, uh, that one eternal is not equal to anyone, he's above everyone. And he's maintaining all the other eternals. So we are of the same quality in essence as Krishna. We are pure spirit, Krishna is pure spirit, except that he is the source of all pure spirit. Just like within the ocean, there are many drops of water that make up the ocean. But the ocean is not the drop and the drop is not the ocean. Although both, excuse me, have the same quality. Mm -hmm. so this is what this first line means. We are non-different in quality with the Lord. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, the jiva or the individual soul is eternally part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada gives the example. Just as the sun rays are minute particles of the brilliant constitution of the sun, so a living entity is a minute particle of the Supreme Spirit. So here we should understand that we are a minute particle of that same spiritual essence, which makes up the absolute truth. The individual and soul and the supreme soul are not separated as in the material differentiation. 
The individual soul is a particle from the very beginning. One should not think that because the individual soul is a particle, it is fragmented from the whole spirit. And this is this idea of fragmentation or broken off. And then when we come back to our natural, pure spiritual consciousness, the fragment again merges with the whole. That is not our philosophy, as Prabhupada goes on to say. Mayavadi philosophy enunciates that the whole spirit exists, but a, but a part of it, which is called jiva, is entrapped by illusion. This philosophy is unacceptable because spirit cannot be divided like a fragment of matter. That part as jiva is eternally a part. Now this is a very essential principle of our tattva, that that fragment of uh, spirit is eternal and is never broken off from the whole. And that means we're never separated from God. The separation idea is that we have been covered by material energy, which is another energy of the Supreme Lord. And because of that cover, covering, we identify with ourselves as being separate. But here, the part, as long as the Supreme Spirit exists, his parts and parcels also exist. So that means eternally. As long as the sun exists, the molecules of the sun's rays also exist. Beautiful analogy because the sun ray and the sun cannot be separated. There's no question of sun rays without the sun. And there's no question of the sun. And there's no question of the sun uh, unless it has energy. That is the en the energy of the sun is the sunshine. So we remain connected to the Lord, but you can see and sometimes a cloud comes in front of the sun and from the purview of those on the ground, you can't see the sun or the rays, although the rays come through, but the sun doesn't. Interesting how this analogy really is exactly how we understand our relationship or our connection with the Supreme Lord. The Jiva particle is estimated in the Vedic literature to be one ten thousandth the size of the upper portion of the hair. It is therefore infinitesimal. So can you imagine one ten thousandth the size of an upper portion of a hair? It's not, you see the upper portion of the hair line is so, you can't even measure it. If you were to take that upper portion, cut it into a hundred parts and take that one of those hundred parts and cut it again into another hundred parts, that's the size of the soul. It is therefore infinitesimal. The Supreme Spirit is infinite, but the living entity or the individual soul is infinitesimal. Although it is not different in quality from the Supreme. The two words in this verse are to be particularly noted. One is nirantaram, which means non-different or the same quality. The individual soul is also expressed here as animanam. Animanam means infinitesimal. The Supreme Spirit is often creating, but the very small spirit is the individual soul. Akanditam means not exactly fragmented, but constitutionally always infinitesimal. That's an important principle. We remain connected, but we are always, we are always uh, infinitesimal. It's like the word jiva, sometimes it's referred to as a soul. Jiva is translated as being tiny. Mm -hmm. No one can separate the molecular parts of the sunshine from the sun, but at the same time, the molecular part of the sunshine is not as expansive, expansive as the sun itself. Similarly, the living entity, but is constitutionally, 
is your position is qualitatively the same as the Supreme Spirit, but he is infinitesimal. So this uh, purport gives you a clear understanding of the nature of our relationship. We are connected, we are, but we are, I guess you could say like a drop to an ocean, like a particle of ray to the sun. These are uh, good material analogies to help us get an understanding of our position in relationship to the Supreme. Now, you have to understand by this analogy, just like the sun particles are never separated from the sun, the water and the ocean, the, the drops are never separated from the ocean. We are never separated from Krishna. This idea of separation is simply the, the idea of illusion, wherein one under the influence of another energy thinks themselves separate. So this thinking of the self separate, this is another example of Maya or that which is not. So when we see that we're never separated from Krishna, but what is that element that makes us separated? And that is our consciousness. When consciousness connects with something that is different than itself, that is the temporary material energy, it identifies with that energy accordingly. So one thinks, well, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I am, you know, I am, you might have an occupation, you identify yourself with that. You're a member of a particular social or communal group, you identify with that. Um, you identify with your role in society as a father or mother. Um, so different identities, which are material identities that we accept due to our association with this third energy, which is called Bahiranga Shakti, which covers the living entity. Although the living entity is pure spirit and can never be separated from the Lord, we think we're regaining our constitutional position. It means wiping away the illusions or destroying the illusions. Now these illusions come in gross and subtle manifestations of themselves. And the more gross they are, the more thicker they are, the more subtle, the more uh, less thick or less uh, covering. But in any case, both the gross and the subtle coverings are, are making us think different than who we are and what we are. Therefore, this false sense of, uh, of self is called ahankara. Ahankara vimudatma prakute iti manyate. Prakuti iti manyate. That the living entity, prakuti kriya manani guni karma sarvasyaha. Ahankara iti ame prakuti vid. Prakuti vidi me perdam. Different manifestations of the material energy. Material energy, like the spiritual energy, is full of. It is always in flux. They, even the scientists, they say that the matter is in flux. Well, we say the matter is ever changing. Uh, the scriptures give six stages of matter. Uh, uh, appearance or, or birth and growth. Then uh, manifestation. Birth, growth, uh, existence, produces some byproducts such as children, etc. 
and then deterioration and then ultimately disappearance. So all matter, all matter goes through these six changes. So we observe that we have a body at a certain stage of development, but we can, you know, understand that we have, have had that same body in a different manifestation of itself. It was maybe a baby, a young boy or a girl, becomes a youth, then it becomes middle-aged, then becomes older, and then gradually becomes very old, and then it leaves. So all these stages of existence are like uh, phases of a, if you're watching a movie, and uh, you see that there's something happening on the screen. But if you were to stop the movie and look at the reel that's turning within the camera, you would see that there's different little sections. Each one is almost the same as the one before. And each one is moving towards another part of itself. But taken together, it looks like something is happening. So our bodies, we don't say they are growing. Sometimes we mistakenly use the word, it's not about growth, it's about change. Change may be sound like the word growth fits into the word change, but actually growth uh, really denotes something that is um, going and uh, developing. Our life is just changing. It's not necessarily developing, it's changing, 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 changing. And we, and here, this is the important part. We, when we look at our life in a objective way, we can see all the changes that we have gone through in life. And we can also presently observe the different manifestations of the material energy that surround us and see how they're all changing. But we don't change. We are the observer of the changes, but we are not changed. But when we identify with the body, then we think as the body changes, I am changing. But that is wrong understanding. We don't change, we remain the same. We are pure spiritual energy always, and we never change our existence, except that we live in this material world. So the success in our endeavors in life is to cut through the misconceptions of our existence and also to awaken Krishna's reality. In other words, who is Krishna? What is his nature? What does he do? How does he interact with others? And how does he conduct himself in different phases of his activities? So that all this knowledge is like cutting away the illusion. Just like the cloud will never stay in front of the sun for a long period of time. Eventually, clouds are always moving. If you can, uh, you observe very carefully, you can see clouds don't stay in one place. Sometimes they move so slowly that it's imperceptible that they're actually moving. But sometimes you can very clearly see how the cloud is moving through the sky. So in the same way, material energy is moving over our consciousness and we are identifying with these different phases of the movement and they're in different stages of our life. But in essence, we are pure spirit soul. We are jiva, tiny, small. Even though we are superior to the material energy, we have a tendency to come under its influence due to 
association with it. Just like if you, uh, if you want, if you want to avoid the association of people that you that you feel will drag you down in life, or for whatever reason you want to avoid that association, then you make arrangements to do that. But if you become attracted to a particular type of association, then you pick up those same characteristics that are indigenous in that association. So due to our desire, this is the important part, desire to enjoy the material energy, we try to control that material energy in different ways in order to facilitate material enjoyment, which is foreign for the soul. The soul cannot enjoy materially. It's like a fish cannot live outside of water. You take the fish, you put it on the land, you give it a nice sand castle. It may live for a few moments, but because it's in the outside of its natural environment, it actually dies. So in the same way, we die to our spiritual existence, which is always there but ne and never lost due to our desire to enjoy in this world. As the desire to enjoy is transformed into the desire to create enjoyment for Krishna, then those coverings that cover the soul and make him think or in a different way is gradually being removed. And when they're fully removed, we can see ourself, we can see Krishna, and we can see the material energy. So that is what the soul is required to perform in order to get out of this illusion of the material body. And the material body is very, very strong. It has a way to overshadow real knowledge and make us think and act in another way. So we have to learn to live in this world and act, but at the same time avoid becoming worldly. And we have to be moving towards self-realization or God realization, which is the same thing. Because again, we are never separated from Krishna, although we think we are. That idea of thinking we are is called Maya. Maya means what is not, or what appears to be something, but is not what it appears to be. Just like um, what would be on the movie screen, you'll see, you know, a theme being played out. You'll see people and you'll see a whole series of events and it you know you can even get emotionally involved in the movie where you actually start becoming affected but ultimately all it is is some you know movie tape moving along with different pictures on it that's all it is <laughs> nothing is really happening but we're looking at it like it's a reality. So in the same way, we look at this uh, world in the same way. We're thinking it's real. And uh, I am, uh, my position is to try to find some enjoyment here. Uh, as soon as we try to enjoy, we become trapped by that enjoyment. If someone is trying to give you something and you refuse to take it, you're not influenced by that. But if you, as soon as you take it, you become affected. So as soon as we accept this material world, 
as a place for enjoyment, then we must go through the whole uh, illusion of accepting so-called suffering and so-called enjoyment as being reality. It's reality in the sense that it's happening, but it's not happening to us, it's happening to our body, which is made of the same nature as the material energy. These are elements. So this is basic spiritual knowledge. And Krishna deals with this particular subject in the beginning of the Gita in the second chapter, where he relegates at least 20 verses to describing the difference between matter and spirit, the difference between the soul and the supreme soul. And so that you can see it comes first in Krishna's discussion he talks about the difference between body and mind and soul in the very beginning before he gets into the activities, either material or spiritual. We have to know who we are distinct from everything that we identify ourselves as being. That way we can understand we don't die. If we are not this body and the body dies, then what dies? Nothing dies. If we're death, the idea of death is, is an illusion. There's no such thing as death. Now, everyone's afraid of death, but no, there's no such thing as death. So there's nothing to be afraid of because it doesn't exist. So what do we mean by that? It means that the soul, the individual, the person, is not subjected to birth and death, it's eternal. And the body, which the soul inhabits, is never alive. It's always dead, but because the presence of the soul energizes the body, the body appears to be working. As soon as the, and if the soul leaves, the body no longer has any life to it. Just like a, a car cannot do anything unless the driver is there. Oh, the car looks very nice. So in the same way, this body is a very nice arrangement and it works in a certain way, but the driver, the soul has to be present. Therefore, birth for the body means that the soul enters into the womb of the mother and the mother provides the, uh, the uh, body and it starts off as a little tiny pea this is mentioned in the fourth canto. The size of the, the body is about the size of a pea when it first develops. The emulsification, the emulsification of the semen, the, the uh, discharge between the male and the female unite together and form a little pea. In that pea, the soul enters. The soul comes from the male into the womb of the female the male provides, that's why it says the male is the father and the, and the, the uh, woman is the mother because she provides the body, just like earth is considered to be mother, where God is considered to be father, where he gives life to earth in the same way that the father gives life, injected into the womb of the mother, and then the body begins to grow by the presence of the soul. Now, sometimes you see a baby comes out born, but it doesn't have any life. So when there's no life, even though the baby's body is intact, there's no life there because just at the time of birth, the child lost its life. In other words, the soul left the body. When the, when the conditions of the body become intolerable for the soul, the soul leaves. That is really how you can, can explain death. Death means that the soul can no longer stay within that body, either by its destined time period or by a series of situations that forces the soul to leave the body. 
So there's no such thing as life for the body because the body is never alive. It's made out of simply dead material elements combined in eight different categories to make up what is called the material body. But the presence of the soul is actually life. Therefore, there's no such thing as death because when the body ends, for whatever reason, the soul goes on to another destination. So the soul never dies and the body is never alive. So when you understand that, you understand death is simply another figmentation of the material energy. It simply means the end of the activities of a particular soul in one particular body, that's all. But death is not final because the soul is never under the influence of the material energy. And therefore, once it's freed from the bodily, bodily situation, um, either through the practice of Krishna consciousness or by the ending of the body, because the, the soul is still encased within the subtle body at the time of death and the mind is there, if the mind still has desires for enjoyment, then that consciousness at the time of death, yam yam vapi sparam bhavam tattva ante kale viram tam tami vaiti kontaya sadata bhava bhavitaha. At the time of death, Krishna says, whatever you think of, there's where you go in your next destination. So liberation comes by way of a culmination of devotional activities throughout one's life that brings one's consciousness to pure spiritual existence. And once that attains, then that leaving of the body is the last time that soul takes on a material body, and then it returns back to the spiritual existence for where it once was, uh, uh, where its origin is. That's why we say back home back to Godhead. We are going back to where we started from, the spiritual world. This world, again, is like a cloud over the sun, but the cloud has an effect of blocking the sun, so this material energy blocks our consciousness of who we actually are and what is our relationship with the Supreme Lord. And the whole process of bhakti is to get through these illusions and come back to our natural, normal, pure spiritual existence. And that's done through the activities of bhakti. It is Prabhupada, in the Bhagavatam actually says that just like you um, go to uh, 11th Canto in Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, second chapter, Verse number 42, I believe, 11, 2, 42. Yeah, this is the verse. Bhakti para sanubhava viraktir anyatra chaisitri eka kala. Here, so here you go. Translation. Direct um, devotion, direct experience of the Lord, and detachment from other th things, these three occur simultaneously for one who is taking shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, note this analogy, in the same way that pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger come simultaneously and increasingly with each bite for a person engaged in eating. Interesting. So as one is eating, they're getting pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger as we engage in devotional service. There is devotion to the Lord, there is the experience of the Lord, and there's detachment the from material things. So this verse is a nice way to give a clear understanding of how devotional service works to bring us to our natural state of pure consciousness. <laughs> okay, 
So we'll stop there. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, uh, for a nice class. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Uh, if you have any questions or any comment, please unmute yourself. Or uh, if you want me I to read out, then I, you can type it in chat window. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, uh, Guru Maharaj, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that there is nothing like a death, but when when the soul leaves the body, is it easy for soul to leave the body? Is it easy for the soul to leave the body? Yeah, is it? Well, it depends. If the soul is attached to the body, no, it's difficult. It doesn't want to go. And sometimes even when death comes, the soul stays around the body mm -hmm. and wants to go back into the body. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes that's why they say we should have kirtan right at the time of death so to push the soul on to its next destination. Yeah, but if one is fixed in Krishna consciousness and it has their consciousness uh, absorbed in Krishna at the time of death, and then that, it says that that becomes so natural and so automatic that if one retains pure Krishna consciousness, just like the flashing of light and thunder is, is less than a second. So the soul, as soon as it disappears from the body, is back in the spiritual world. That fast, like the flashing of lightning and thunder. But because of the... So therefore, you'll see, and this is explained in other various other religious scriptures that believe in reincarnation also, that the more sinful the soul is, the longer it takes to get its next body. <laughs> the more purer the soul is, the faster it moves to its next destination. And when it's fully purified, it's instantaneous. <laughs> oh, okay. That's such a great help. So it, just in case, if suppose... Uh, you know, sometimes if we die in accident and there's nobody there to do the kirtan or we can't, we forget to take like Krishna's name or chanting or anything. It's just spur of a moment. It happens. Then in that case, what happens? Sudden, sudden death can cause the soul to, to stay in the subtle body and hover around the body. And then it, it stays in a ghostly body. And then unless, it, um, then in that ghostly body, it just becomes miserable. These can happen like a, like a, a, a plane crash or a car crash, something like that, where death mm. can becomes instantaneously. Mm. The soul is immediately thrown out, but at the same mm. time, it's still attached. <laughs> mm. So how do All we help? These, yeah, that's, there's nothing much you can do. They take ghostly bodies or they hover around that particular body. If the body is destroyed beyond, beyond repair, then uh, the, uh, just like it mentions that uh, in the fight between demigods and demons, and when, uh, when the demons were being killed by the demigods, uh, there was one mystic demon, his name is Maya Donovan. He was taking the bodies of the demons and putting them in this elixir of immortality and they were coming back to life again. So there, there are herbs that can revive a dead body, but and there's herbs that can heal wounds too, even in the dead body. Um, these herbs are very special and very hard to find herbs. They're usually found in different remote mountainous areas. And they still exist on some places in the planet. Some of those herbs are 
gone. But when the body is no longer repairable, even by herbs, then the soul can never come back into that body. Mm -hmm. mm. So will, how long that ghostly, they have to live in that ghostly body? It depends on their karma. <laughs> Oh, okay. Mm. Can we not help some yeah. someone like that? That's why they, that's why we do the pinda. Pinda, okay. yeah, we in the worship of the forefathers. We mm. push the forefathers who are stuck in a particular body at the time after death they get a particular body to move them further along towards spiritual existence. We had the Shraddha ceremony. Lord oh. Chaitanya even performed the Shraddha ceremony for his, I think his father, yeah. Just to show example that this is what the benefit of the Shraddha ceremony is. Okay. Yeah. But generally we don't engage in that. We just simply chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, have kirtan and pray for that soul. But there's formal, ways to pray in order to get the maximum amount of benefit like that. Mm. There are souls that are everywhere that are stuck in different bodies in different situations. Some of them become, you know, ghosts, lower entities, and then they just give trouble to everybody else. They enter into people's dreams and cause problems. Or especially when a person becomes uh, engaged in intoxication, uh, mm. they become susceptible to be controlled by these unembodied souls. Mm. This existence we are on with this gross physical, physical body is the lowest of all existence. There are different levels of existence. Uh, there's one verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam I can't mm -hmm. remember where it is. It's in the 10th canto, I think. It just talks about the gradations of living entities from one level to another. And ghosts are superior to human beings mm -hmm. because they don't have a physical body. Mm. So you can read about that. I forgot that verse. It's really interesting. It's a long list of gradations of different level entities. Each one more higher than another on the material level. Okay. Uh, if somebody could find that verse, I'm not sure. I, I just read it recently. It's really interesting, but I can't remember where I read it. It might be somewhere in the beginning of the 10th canto, which I think it is. Just a whole level of gradations of living beings. If somebody could find that verse, it's an interesting verse. Yeah. I think it's more than one verse. It's about four or five verses put together describing these different categories of living entities and their gradations from one level to the next. Mm. So after the ghostly body, do they come back to human or any other body? Mm -hmm. How what happens? Um, mm. Well, they have to live out that that karma, mm -hmm. and then they take birth in another situation by the law of karma. But it's a miserable existence because. Ghost means having material desires and can't fulfill them. That's why they they enter into other bodies so they can fulfill their material desires through other people. Yeah, true. Most people in the world are haunted by ghosts. <laughs> Mostly everybody is. <laughs> because mm -hmm. they speak all kinds of nonsense. <laughs> so that's an example. An example of ghost. Gurudev Hare Krishna. <clears throat> Please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, Gurudev, I, I found that verse. Uh, it's uh, in Lord Rishabdev's teachings. Uh, 
This is not the verse. <laughs> well, let me see. This is the one you put up on the screen now? No, 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 no. The, the, this verse you were talking about that uh, the different species. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that one is 5.5.2122. Yeah, I think you got it. Put it up. We'll take a look at it. <laughs> yeah, I remember now. I did. I think I did it with the uh, with one of my classes with the other groups. Five point five twenty one twenty. Yes, you're right. It's in that area. Here you go. Somebody read it. I can I can read it, Gurudev. <clears throat> Just the translation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Just the translation. Okay. It's quite long. Okay. Um, of the two energies manifest, spirit and dull matter, beings possessing living force, vegetables, grass, trees, and plants, are superior to dull matter, stone, earth, etc. Superior to non-moving plants and vegetables are worms and snakes, which can move. Superior to worms and snakes are animals that have developed intelligence. Superior to animals are human beings. And superior to human beings are ghosts because they have no material bodies. Superior to ghosts are the Gandavas and, the, and superior to them are the Siddhas. Superior to Siddhas are the Kinnaras and superior to them are the Asuras. Superior to the Asuras are the demigods. And of the demigods, Indra, the king of heaven, is supreme. Superior to Indra are the direct sons of Lord Brahma. Sons like King Daksha and supreme among Brahma's sons is Lord Shiva. Since Lord Shiva is the son of Lord Brahma, Brahma is considered superior. But Brahma is also subordinate to me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, because I am inclined to the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas are the best of all. Yeah, spoken by Rishabdev. Yeah, this is this is the verse. Yeah. So you get you get the idea of the gradations of different levels of beings. This is all on the material level though, until it comes to uh, Shiva and and uh, Krishna ultimately. But Brahma, Brahma is also subordinate to me. <laughs> but because I am inclined to the Brahmanas, the Brahmanas are the best of all. So they're the best of all human beings are the Brahmanas. Okay, so that's interesting. Thank you for finding that verse. Please accept my humble obeisances or glories to Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> my question is, in this particular um, class, uh, Guru Maharaj, you very clearly explained to us the nature of the soul, who we really are. But the Mayavadi philosophers have a different take on it. They agree to the presence of the Supreme Soul. But what is their position when it comes to the jiva? I didn't quite understand that. Would you please explain? Um, they think it's all it's all Maya. Everything is Maya, and everyone is is the jiva is only a jiva in a manifestation. But when it reaches its potential as as a pure spiritual entity, it takes on the position of being the supreme. So we're only jivas when we're in the manifestation of the material energy. But when we become self-realized, then we become God. Mm -hmm. Everyone is God. And that's true from one perspective that everyone is godly by nature, but never, not everyone is God. So they mix up the, the qualitative person thing with the quantitative and put it both together because the jiva is the same as the supreme, they think the jiva is also the supreme. 
So fragmentation is only for the manifestation, but once the manifestation is, is destroyed by the process of liberation, then one again attains their state of being the supreme. That's why they, they address themselves, Om Namo Narayana. Mm -hmm. They call each other Narayan. So while we are in this material world, their position is that we are in illusion and we yeah. are covered over by this illusory energy. And the moment we take off the illusory energy, we are going to become God. That doesn't make sense because if we're God, how does the illusionary energy cover God? Right. It's not possible. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. But then, then they said, then they answered that. Well, that's just Leela. So God has a Leela becoming illusioned. <laughs> they give the Leela answer, which is not. It's just. An, uh, it's really no answer at all. But because they are stuck in that position and they're firmly entrenched in what they believe, it's very difficult for them to understand bhakti. Is that correct? Well, they're envious because they want to be the supreme and therefore they make the philosophy centered around that principle. They don't want to serve the Lord. That's why Lord Brahma speaks one verse, Aruna Krishchena Padam Padam Padanti Yada. Uh, they rise very high on the spiritual platform, but because they don't engage in devotional service, they fall down again to the material energy. And that's why you see Mayavadis, they all have some kind of material activities. Because they don't. Like come across Mayavadis. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. So supposing I come across a Mayavadi and he's, he or she starts saying that, you know, you're an illusion, you're just covered over by the material energy, which is all true. I am illusion. I am covered over by the material energy. And what is their practice to regain our original position? What do they, uh, what did, what did they uh, follow in order to, according to them, As, who they really austerities. are? austerity, various types of pujas. They worship the deity in order to become the deity. They worship, they chant the holy names of the Lord to go beyond the holy name into the unmanifested. To become one with the Supreme and then also when you're one with the Supreme, you're also the Supreme. Wow. It's envy. It's, it's we, we, we call it, uh, we don't call it philosophy, we call it philosophy. Yes. <laughs> and it goes, it goes on, it's very strong, especially in the land of India. Mm. But, you know, I've had count encounters with many Mayavadis, and you can't really argue with them because, you know, they have their own, mm, program of argumentation where they take the Vedic literatures and give their own interpretations of the verses. That's all. Like Krishna says, Mamai Vamsa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana Masastani Indriyani Prakritistani Karshati. They say, yeah, oh, that's fine, but that's only during the manifestation. It's not eternal. Mm -hmm. Krishna says Sanatana. <laughs> he says it's eternal. But they say it's only during the manifestation that that's true. <laughs> they have their own arguments. Whatever the argument you have, they have an argument for. Don't worry. So therefore, Lord Chaitanya said, Mayavadi Krishna Aparadi. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in that sense, at least followers of the other religions, they are following a personal God and they're admitting that they're servants of God and they must engage. Their process may not be perfect, but at least they have the correct understanding that God is God and we are his servants. Yeah, and then, you know, the major religions of the world follow that principle. Their, their knowledge of the Supreme and their knowledge of how to reach the Supreme is, is very simple, simplified through prayer and through various types of worship. 
which is good. It's simple bhakti, <laughs> but it doesn't answer the higher the questions of whether the, the nature of the Supreme. They talk about God, but they don't really know who is God. They, they make their prayers. They say, we're offering our prayers to God. But then we say, well, what is your understanding of God? Well, he's in the sky. Okay, and so there are so many birds in the sky too. <laughs> so he's up there somewhere, but what is he? Well, and then they caricaturize him some like, they put an old man sitting on the cloud, throwing thunderbolts down and they, or whatever caricaturized ways they have. Or if one religion says, no one has ever seen the face of God, therefore um, they, they never give any description of God because they say no one has ever seen it. Mm. So they all have, they all have some truth, but mostly it's, it's mostly uh, speculation. When you come to the Vedic uh, path, and you'll see that everything is time tested, practiced, understood, and cooperated by uh, three, three points of knowledge. The guru, the, the teachers have gone before, and Krishna in words in the Shastras. So Srila Prabhupada has really given such a wonderful and complete and uh, graphic description of the spiritual world, Krishna, the gopis, our relationship, everything. So really, Srila Prabhupada's books are the law books for the next 10,000 years without a doubt. Yeah, well, if you do a comparative study, you come to that conclusion. People don't want to do that comparative study. They just want to go on with their illusion. Thank you. Guru. It's like we say, we say, we say the Supreme Lord is a cowherd boy. Mm -hmm. And they say, no, he isn't. Then we say, okay, if he isn't, then what is he? And they can't give any answer. Mm -hmm. If you can't say what God is, you can't say what God is not. If you can't say what God is, then you can't say what God is not. Mm -hmm. And we can very clearly you know. say who God is, and we can say who God is not, because we have the complete description. Right. And it's cooperated. It's not just coming from one source, as Arjuna did that in the Bhagavad Gita. Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram, Vidamutamam. You know, the whole... Uh, Two verses in the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, Arjuna confirms by the words of Krishna himself and by the words of the Acharyas that the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita is the Supreme Lord himself. So by reading these books, we will become very well versed with the knowledge and we will be able to... Um, defend the philosophy uh, in a very emphatic and very convincing way. Is that correct? Yeah. Convincing means you have to know the scriptures. You have to be able to explain the scriptures. You have to know what is not the scriptures. And you have to know how to use examples in order to bring out the points that you're trying to uh, present. Right. Yeah, this is the verse spoken by a good, good yeah. Param Brahma Param Dhamma Pavitram Param Bhavam Purusham Ashashvata Divyam Ari Devi Majam Vibhu Ahus Tvam Rishaya Sarve Devi Arshir Nardas Tata Asita Devalo Vyas Aswayan Chava Bravishime Go ahead Sri Devi, read the translation. Arjuna said, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead the ultimate abode, the purest, the absolute truth. You are the eternal, transcendental, original person, the unborn, the greatest. All the great sages such as Narada, Asita, Devala, and Vyasa confirm this truth about you. And now you yourself are declaring it to me. And so the first line in the purport, 
in these two verses, the Supreme Lord gives a chance to the Mayavadi philosopher. But it's here clear that the same is, is different from the individual soul. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Baba gets right to it. In, yeah. So the Supreme Lord is con confirming who he is in the Bhagavad Gita. I am the source of all spiritual worlds. Everything comes from me. The wise who know this engage in my devotional service and worship. So Krishna confirms in different ways who, what is his position as the Supreme Lord. But only when it's cooperated by other great saints and sages does it have an effect. Those people don't believe the Lord or they don't take the words as being the words of the Lord. But when many persons who are authorities speak it, then it becomes clear. But speaking with Maya bodies, they are very, very expert at using words to make you believe something different than what is actual truth. That's why I've seen I've seen it. I saw a debate between two senior devotees, one taking the position of a Mayavadi and one taking the position of the, the Bhakta devotee. And because the, the person who took the position of the Mayavadi was a good debater, he was actually on a debating team in college, he, he won the argument. Mm. Well, that's that's um, that's how Maya bodies are. They're argumentative. They're very good at arguing and using words and pulling verses here and there just to support their wrong ideas. Hmm. But when you listen to their arguments, you can and you know the arguments given by our acharyas, especially see the Prabhupada, it becomes clear where is the fallacy in their arguments. But if you don't know, then you really, what they say sounds logical and reasonable. Mm. Just like there is this one person who's trying, can you, can you prove, can anybody prove that God does not exist? Hmm. I think it's very easy to prove that God exists. But to prove that God does not exist, how is that even possible? It's not possible. If, if, if you know the science of epistemology, which epistemology is the science of knowing, of how to know something. In that science, it gives a statement that one cannot prove a negative. Hmm. So prove that a 20-headed lion does not exist. <laughs> well, nobody's seen, nobody's seen it. Well, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist because nobody's seen it. So you can't prove a negative. That's why when people say, I, I prove that there's no God, immediately, they're immediately caught in a lie. Because you can't prove it even with all your arguments, logic, and so many other things. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, it's good to know this philosophy. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Maharaj, I have one question on this uh, verse which was mentioned on Rishav Dev. Yeah, uh, Vrindavanath, give me one minute. I just need to break for a second. Sure, sure. Be right, be right back. Hare 
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I was having this question on this uh, Vyasdev verse 5.5.21 on that uh, degradation one. So Krishna has mentioned the best of all is Brahmanaj. But uh, he has not mentioned devotee as like best because everywhere he has mentioned devotee because Brahmana can be engaged in devotional service but they, they may not be like they might be in other yeah but he it's only it's only talking about the gradation of living beings on the material level brahmana is still material no we don't need you see the gradations are all only material Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Brahman is the best, but higher than a Brahman is a Vaishnava. Yes, Guru Maharaj, I got it. I was thinking the same, like why, like he has not mentioned Brahman, Vaishnavaj or, yeah, I got it. Yes, yeah, it's all material. So Guru Maharaj, we are seven minutes over. Uh, there is no question on the chat. Okay. We can stop here and we'll continue tomorrow with the next verse, number 18 in the series. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for this session. Thank you, devotees, for joining this session. Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Gurudev ki jai, Anand Koti Vaishnav Brandi ki jai. Okay. Thank you very much. 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 Th